Hello, and welcome to this reunion session, a fireside chat between myself and Sloan alum Donna Levin. My name is Fiona Murray, and I'm the Associate Dean for Innovation and Inclusion. I've been a Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the MIT School of Management for over 20 years. And so I'm particularly delighted to welcome many generations of alum, some of whom I've been lucky enough to teach, and many who remain close friends and colleagues. One such colleague joining me today is Donna Levin, a graduate of the Ember class of 2016 and a survivor of my teaching in Idea Week during her MBA. <laughs> Donna, thank you for being here with me. Thank I really, really appreciate it. Before we begin our conversation, I want to just share a little bit about Donna's background. Donna is the Chief Executive Officer of the Arthur M. Blank School for Entrepreneurial Leadership at Babson College. An accomplished entrepreneur and business leader, she was the co-founder of Care.com, a company that has made a difference to many of our lives, my own included, and Vice President for Operations for You Promise. Prior to her current role at Babson, she served as the Executive Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and she was a Senior Lecturer at MIT Sloan. At MIT, in her transition from student to faculty member, she oversaw the MBA Entrepreneurship and Innovation track, taught courses designed to help students build scalable ventures, she mentored MIT students across all the schools on campus. She served as part of the teaching and learning and coaching team for the Trust Center's two accelerator programs, MIT Fuse and MIT Delta V. Donna, thank you again for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. As you know, MIT is always feeling like home. So Donna, I wanted to start by just asking you about your decision to come to MIT. Where were you in your career journey? What was your thinking? And what made you choose to come and join us at the MIT School of Management? Absolutely. So around the time, um, just backing up, I've always known that I wanted to get an MBA at some point. And uh, when You Promise was acquired, um, I thought, this is the time. Um, but we were very fortunate that we raised money and we started Care.com. Uh, like most entrepreneurs, I thought that was going to be like two years and we were going to go solve our next problem and I was going to go off to school. And those two years turned to 10 years. Um, and after disclosing that I didn't plan on aging in place and as we knew we were going to go public, um, actually, uh, and looking at different programs, I knew I wanted to do a few different things. One. Um, I'm all about mission and impact. Um, so I wanted to be part of a cohort and um, a place about mission and impact. Um, uh, the second one is that I wanted to build a whole new network. Um, we all couldn't leave Care.com. We had been together for 16 years at this point across the two companies. Um, and then the third one, um, I felt like I had been treading water for a really long time. Um, most of my uh, you know, colleagues, they had already gone to graduate school. So I felt like, you know, I was keeping up, but I wanted to excel. Um, and it was actually one of my other co-founders, he thought, I think you can get into that program at MIT. And of course, I thought, there's no way I can get into that program at MIT. So um, I was delighted when I got to come for sort of the preview day. And I was determined, I'm like, I'm going to do whatever I can. I want to be part of that program. Well, we were very fortunate that you chose to apply and that uh, our admissions team was smart enough to decide <laughs> that you were absolutely one of the right people to, uh, to join us. It's actually hard to hear you say that you felt like you had been treading water and you hadn't made as much progress when in the time leading up to your coming to the MBA and the executive MBA program, uh, you'd started two companies. I think that's probably, um, I think people are starting to talk about that more on entrepreneurs. You are forced, you know, you're supposed to always be in sales mode. And so you're always on and you're talking about your mission and you're trying to inspire your team. Um, every boardroom you walk into, you have to prove that you still deserve the right to be part of your company. Um, most of my background is with venture backed companies. Um, 
but there's always another milestone. You know, I've shared this. It always feels like failure until someone else says it's success. There's an endless list of milestones that you have to achieve and keep achieving and keep achieving. And so over time, yes, it does feel like, you know, you know you always need to learn more. You always need to be evolving. It's also interesting because these are, a lot of these milestones are set by other people, so they're externally set. I think what's very nice about deciding to take some time off and, and come into a program like the Ember program is that you, in some ways you get to set your own milestones and think about what that learning journey is that you want for yourself. That's a yes. And to my Ember alums, that's a definite no. <laughs> because of all the reading that the faculty <laughs> exactly. um, the The reading, the pace, um, uh, definitely, I loved, uh, you know, the diagram about sort of the stress curve, mm -hmm. you know, of Can how, you like us? the time of, this, yes, of, you know, like we've mapped out over time and this is what your stress level looks like. And it was just like, okay, we could do that. Um, and then there was one sort of the bull's eye of, you know, like, here's your comfort zone, you know, here's sort of where you start to stress and here's like where you should be and uh, getting comfortable with that discomfort. And uh, so, yes, we were all in, uh, but my learning group, we will tell you, you know, being part of that 1159 submission club, it was yes. like, okay, yes, there was some control and other areas of, we learned, you know, how to deliver and sometimes that good enough really is good enough yep. to some, keep moving forward. Sometimes it really is. <laughs> so before we talk about any more of those challenges, tell us about some of the most fun parts of your executive MBA time at uh, MIT. Oh my gosh, I was thinking about this. Um, and so in full disclosure, obviously I learned, I loved all of my time at MIT so much so that I never wanted to leave. You know, I came away with a whole set of new knowledge. Uh, when I think about those frameworks that are just timeless that I've learned, um, definitely, uh, you know, thank you on uh, getting to that comfort and my confidence uh, once we all got really comfortable with the discomfort yes. and the stretch to realize that maybe we can do more than we thought we could. Um, and then the network, um, aside from, you know, uh, having great faculty members, now some I consider colleagues and friends. Um, also, my cohort and classmates have continued to be so active in my life. Um, so all of that, some of them are my absolute best friends and I am so incredibly grateful and thankful for and I didn't know going into it. You know, we serve on boards together, they serve as advisors, that they're so um, uh, integrated into my life. Um, some of my most memorable moments and uh, things that I absolutely loved, um, it started early. I loved Walmart Week. You know, I still go back and think about Walmart Week and learning to take a look at anything from all different angles um, and all of these different perspectives. So just to set back, right, this is when we, <laughs> when we present the Walmart case. Yes. And so we take a company and then we start to look at it from you know, the strategic point of view, how might the investors feel, yes. what about other stakeholders, social responsibility. So you're really trying to take a sort of 360 with an organization in the middle. No, yeah, I, I found it fascinating and love that experience. Um, you know, I was smiling when you mentioned Idea Lab. Um, you know, I won't, don't take this away if our Idea Lab team is listening or watching. You know, our team, we were one of those teams that we learned a lot. Um, um, there was a lot of emotion uh, during that experience and a lot of great memorable moments that we still crack up about today. Um, but I took away going into that week as like, okay, I'm an entrepreneur, like this is it. I'm so excited to realize that, oh my goodness, you know, uh, some of the things that you took for granted, like those are uh, hardcore things that you need to pull back. Uh, reinforcing that the idea doesn't really matter it really is about the team and the team's ability to execute. Um, so that was fantastic. Um, and then I think GoLab was one of those moments where we actually had a chance to take all those tools that we learned um, and realize that we could apply them to almost any situation. Um, so I loved my GoLab experience. And for those of you who don't know GoLab, it's almost six months long yes. um, on sort of the prep 
of uh, learning and going deeper and figuring out um, what frameworks you can sort of pull out of your toolkit to help this other organization. Um, and then also, you know, working with this group of team. So that was a fantastic experience. And but which organization did you work with? Okay, we got Crystal Lagoons, which is fantastic. We got to go to Chile. Crystal Lagoons is an amazing company that takes brackish water and turns it into almost like man-made lakes and oceans all over the world. Um, so we got to work with them. That We had a great time and learned so much um, and had some great moments, but you guys threw us when we came back. Oh, we did? What, and did, what did we do? Because we had a week where we got to work with a nonprofit. And as opposed to Crystal Lagoons, where we had, you know, six months to prep, we had a week to work with a nonprofit. And it was amazing. And it was a whole new team mm -hmm. uh, to realize very quickly how all of those same tools could come in um, and be into play. And it turns out that same nonprofit was really instrumental later in my son's life and his decision to like focus more on civic engagement. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Because as you say, one of the interesting things about uh, MIT Sloan is that it is a school of management. And so we think about applying our management tools to large corporations that could be global in scope, to startups, to not-for-profit organizations, to the government and public sector. And so I think that's a really important part of how we think about it, is that there's not one set of tools for the um, for-profit part of the economy and a completely different set for everybody else. Yes. So perhaps you can say more about the nonprofit that you Absolutely. work with. Absolutely. So I believe they've changed their name. I'll talk to you about their mission. Uh, they were focused on how do we uh, get our youngest learners to think about civic engagement and um, their power to create change um, in their community, um, in their cities, and sort of in their states. Uh, one of their big things was uh, a program they called Civics Day. And so they were trying to figure out how to connect more leaders to Civics Day, how to build their brand, how to think about their fundraising strategy. They had a, a whole long list um, of things, and we actually got to go and attend one of their Civics Day and to think about how they went into more school systems. Um, I live in Newton. They moved into the Newton school system. Um, my son was the recipient of one of those Civics Days on uh, his project and uh, their ability to create change. And fast forward, you know, in the fall, he's going to be focused on political science. He has been all in on all things civics based on that experience. That's amazing. And it's wonderful how all these sort of threads of life kind of come, come together. And especially at the moment, I mean, you know, a number of things you've said have raised so many questions in my mind. But one of the most important pieces of this, I think, is learning how to turn up effectively in different organizations. And so how you might do that in your own startup as one of the founders and part of the leadership team, how instead you go to Chile and show up yes. as a sort of internal student consultant team, but then how we show up with civic organizations. And we are thinking a lot about that as part of our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion at MIT Sloan. And thinking in particular how we show up in the greater Boston ecosystem with organizations and not come in and say, we're here to tell you what to do, yes. but in fact, we're here to be a partner with you. And so I don't know whether you could reflect a little on some of your experiences and how you thought about showing up with that organization focused on civic engagement. Absolutely. Um, you know, a big part of it, and. I believe we had a few moments of this in our cohort about, you know, uh, listening isn't waiting for your turn to talk. Um, it's really sort of listening. Uh, you know, imagine bringing so many executives together and everybody wants to sort of get their point in um, and really learn. From that experience, um, it's allowed me also to pull back. You know, um, one of my uh, classmates actually joined and became a board member of that organization. And as we think about uh, so many of us at this point in our career, uh, a way that we choose to engage is through board service. And how, as a board member, do you walk that fine line of I'm here to support yes. um, what you want to do, how you want to move forward, and um, I can't tell you exactly what to do, uh, but I can provide you with tools and resources. And, um, you know, I guess I would give a shout out, and I don't know, to my strategy professors. Um, you know, spoiler alert, I love strategy. Um, you know, working with this one um, organization that's really trying to, you know, their whole thing is that they want to save public radio. 
and the transition that they were going to of sort of this move to digital, it took me right back to the classroom where we were talking about moving to a new S curve and all of the changes, there was this great diagram about all the changes that happen in an organization. And I remember sitting there because at the time, care.com, like our stock was tanking, everything was happening. You know, there was this big move uh, where everything was moving to mobile. And so we couldn't track and trend the way that we could. And I was like, oh my goodness, this slide sort of reflects my life at this moment. I realized that same slide reflected what was happening in this nonprofit at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so as opposed to trying to help them solve their problems, I honestly pulled up the slides from class um, and shared of like, you're not alone. You know, this is what's happening. And um, you know, here are some frameworks that you can take to sort of go off and think about it and, and let us know. Not trying to tell them what to do, but to uh, address with what they were doing with right now and how do we supply them with tools and resources to let them go solve their problems and be successful. So it sounds Donna, like the teacher in you comes out, whether you're actually in a CEO role, a founder role, as a board member, I think that resisting that urge to actually tell the CEO, I mean, I sometimes find myself in that situation thinking, I wish I could just tell them really what I think they should be doing, but that's actually not my role. Now I'm on the board. Uh, and also as a teacher, because obviously you've now spent, you spend a lot of time, I imagine, teaching uh, and we've been very lucky to have you in the classroom um, with us, and we really are very appreciative of that fact. I wonder if you can um, tell us a little bit. I wanted to step back and actually ask you about your pathway into entrepreneurship. Uh, oftentimes, we, we know that people can be very successful entrepreneurs when they start being entrepreneurs later in their career. You know, other people, that's something that they do right from the beginning of their career. So can you tell us a bit about your pathway? Absolutely. Um so I never considered myself an entrepreneur, you know, for years. No one was saying that phrase. And um, I think I thought about uh, entrepreneurship when I was a consultant. So my background is quite a mix of things. Technology was how I paid for school. Um, you know, it was sort of a real struggle. And so I, I did a number of different jobs. You know, I was at University Park at MIT testing uh, PCL5 cards and BIOS chips at one point in my life. Um, fast forward, having been in, you know, shrink wrap software, um, uh, I was at sort of this consulting company that was really a dev shop for hire. And most of my clients were on the West Coast at this point. I was running a small business unit, and they all were startups. And they considered themselves startups. They were all laser focused on a mission, which definitely appealed to me. Um, and for a number of reasons, I decided, I think I want to go and be part of a smaller organization where everyone is laser focused on a mission that we're trying to move forward. And the first company, which I will not name, um, I joined and it was an absolute disaster. Um, you know, uh, even, you know, it seemed like during the interview process, everyone was laser focused on a mission. Um, there was a lot of dysfunction, a lack of communication. Um, we weren't working well together. Um, you know what they say, sort of opportunity from crisis. It was a great opportunity for me because I kept getting promoted, not because I was the best qualified, just because I was willing to talk to everyone and to try and create consensus. And we went from this path of, hey, Goldman Sachs is gonna you know, lead us as we go public to we're shutting the doors. Um, and coming out of that experience, um, I knew a few things, wanted to do my better diligence, um, but I wanted to be part of a team um, that was always focused on solving a problem, that I did better when I was really clear and passionate about what it was that we were solving and how we were moving forward. And that's how I landed at Upromise, which was a company focused on helping people save money for college, yes. since that wasn't part of you know, my original uh, story or what was in my basement. And uh, you know, getting that uh, company or that product uh, from an idea to an actual it, and then growing it over time was extremely compelling because we were so focused on the mission. And at some point, someone started calling us entrepreneurs along the way of like, oh, this is what entrepreneurs do. Um, um, and by the time, um, you know, uh, You Promise was acquired uh, by Sally Mae and our mission changed, um, there were a lot of different options. One, there were some problems I wanted to go off and solve or I wanted to go gain new knowledge. 
Um, and one of the things that happened while I was at You Promise, um, I had my first child. We sort of talked about him a little. Yes. Um, uh, but when I was due to go back to work, he had a seizure-like episode. Um, and it was a really horrible period in our lives. That must have been incredibly difficult. It was, it, like the results were inconclusive, like all of our plans, and my husband's a therapist, and I was at this startup, and you know, we thought our son, like we had this plan, and he was gonna go to daycare, and realized that that's not an option unless we were sending someone to daycare with him. Yes. Um, and so we were like ships passing in the night. You know, he left his job, he was home during the day, saw clients at night, I was at this startup, and it was a really tough three year period until we figured out what was going on with his health. To one, every single one of the other co-founders had a similar problem. And um, here it was, you promised, you know, we didn't talk about big data or machine, we didn't talk about any of that stuff, but we were tracking everything, your credit card, your grocery, your gas, your mortgage, all of this information, and we were still looking for care through the phone book um, and like posting stuff in the library, and we thought we can go solve this problem, we can go solve it quickly. Um, and that was the start of care.com. It was more of everyone has this challenge, and we think we can go do something about it, so let's just go do that and, you really and move have. forward. I've, I've just been using them only this last few months. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a durable solution, but what a difficult time to start a company. But as you say, there's probably no best time, but that sounds incredibly challenging. You've mentioned your son and I hope that he is fine. He's My son is doing great. And now I also, I had a care.com baby too. Yeah. She's doing fantastic too. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's nice that we can actually sort of talk about life and the life that happens <laughs> in the midst of careers and in the midst exactly. of trying to do very stressful things and take leadership mm -hmm. roles and know that you, you have to go out there and sort of be in leadership roles and sometimes sort of really believe that you know what you're doing when sometimes you're not totally sure. <laughs> exactly. um, and then come home and actually have to do the same thing sometimes yes. and perhaps admit that you don't always know. We were just discussing <laughs> um, what, it, what life looks like in the background of a Zoom. Yes. And the signs that I think you mentioned your children like to put oh up. Oh my if, gosh, yes. If they want something from you during Zoom. Yes, it's more of, you know, there's a system of text messages of either I'm teaching right now, so you can't come in, or, you know, I have a board meeting, or I'm doing an interview you you know you can't come in right now and it's still the somehow disconnect of but you're still mom and you're still present. and in your home like you're like your mom your home and I have a question or a need and so I won't interrupt you but maybe I could hold up a sign and you might see it and somehow like tell me what to do while you're doing this other thing so pandemic joy yeah I often tell this story of um being in Taiwan doing some executive teaching and getting a phone call in the middle of this teaching, which must have been towards the end of the day, so it was very early in the morning, Boston time, and it was my son saying to me, Mommy, do you know where my soccer cleats are? And I said, well, I think I do, but I'm in Taiwan right now. And he said, I know, but I just need my soccer shoes. <laughs> exactly. And so I think that is sort of life. People talk about sort of work-life balance. I think it's much more about the collision of yes you know, what we're trying to do on so many different fronts. And that's a, something that has been rendered much more visible uh, during the pandemic, but I think has always been true. And it sounds like it's something that has always been part of how you think about the calculus of your different oh, journeys yes. and your and what gives you purpose. So I'm curious, as you are now thinking about, you made a big transition um, really into teaching. You joined us on the faculty, as I mentioned, and we were absolutely delighted to have you come and join us as somebody with such entrepreneurial experience who's really willing to reflect upon that experience in an authentic way and not tell a perfect story, um, which I think sometimes happens. And so share with our students how difficult it can be. Uh, you then went and uh, focused on entrepreneurial leadership and management at WPI. And now you obviously have this enormous and really important role uh, at Babson College. And so first, congratulations. Thank you. It's a wonderful choice that they made. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I say the full name as the Arthur and Blank School for Entrepreneurial Leadership. I think about um, three things and uh, the reason that really excites me. Uh, so, Babson has uh, seven centers and institutes, similar to how we think about the Innovation Initiative MIT, which is really helpful in helping people understand all of the great resources that MIT has to offer. This school is designed to do just that on how do we 
uh, shine a spotlight on all the resources that the school has to offer and also create a path. Um, the thing that also excites me um, about the school um, is that um, from my time at WPI, being on that President's Council, uh, to now at Babson, um, there's a lot of conversation and dialogue about um, what is the, what's the new business model? You know, how do we innovate on that business model? And as you know, I love challenges. And um, one of the things is that we're also focused on how are we innovating on our business model? And are we doing that in a way that we can partner, that it's collaborative, that we're looking at uh, different modes of delivery and also different ways of monetizing? So it speaks to that core part of me that also wants to be in this mode of constant creation and testing um, and doing that on behalf of an institution. And then the third one is really about the expansion of the brand. You know, we talked about this notion of being considered an entrepreneur. Yes. Um, but there was something that from that very first time of mentoring at MIT to the first demo day, you know, um, my mother was there and she said, Donna, honestly, you look more excited and proud right now than you did mm -hmm. when your company went public. I so right, so your mother was in the audience. Oh my gosh, yes. And watching you while you were actually watching the students. That you I was had helping mentors. the students get on stage and helping them prep. And mm -hmm. it was this moment of clarity of, I've been so focused on a time of how can I go off and solve a problem with a team to now, how can I support so many teams going off to solve big, you know, interesting, challenging problems that needed to be solved either in the world or just in their community? And, um, and so something you probably have known for a very long time as it relates to your career, but that was a real aha moment for me of this is where I want to be. And, you know, I had conversations of people like, hey, so what are you doing? What are you thinking about next? I'm like, you don't understand. I'm deliriously happy. I'm deliriously happy. Oh, and so I want to stay I'm, in this space. I'm very <laughs> pleased. There is something about watching your students having success and sort of stepping up, stepping out on the stage, presenting the ideas, because you know what they've been working on in the background. You know that they've almost taped themselves together just to get to that moment. And then to watch them over time, as I've especially had the opportunity to do, is, is, is really extraordinary. I was just sitting the other day listening to the presentations from our students at the Legatum Center. And as I think you know, those students are focused on startups in uh, growth markets, largely in sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, extraordinary opportunities, huge challenges. Talk about a group of young people with a mission, yes. so mission driven. But there's really this incredible sense of sort of pride when you actually watch them and you feel as if you're part of their journey. And there's something that's very replenishing about that, I think, every single semester. Hey, agree. And so, um, so this was a perfect opportunity for me. And I definitely think, you know, going back to the EMBA program, yes. like this was the hard pivot that I did not see coming. I didn't see this one coming. That's sometimes yes. the best things <laughs> happen that way, don't they? Um, I want to ask you, I mean, one of the things that is sort of, I think so much on all of our minds is the real importance of inclusion. Mm -hmm. Inclusion in our economy, in our communities, in our society, but definitely inclusion in entrepreneurship. And obviously, I've thought a lot, and you have lived the experience of being a, um, a female entrepreneurship, a woman of color as an entrepreneur. Would you say a little bit about that? And then perhaps we can shift to also talking about Absolutely. what we do to support. Yes, so there have definitely been some extreme highs and some extreme lows. Um, you know, um, I would say almost shame on me um, at one point in my career. Uh, and I'll say the, the reason why. Um, sometimes when you're so focused on solving a challenge or a mission, you are like, you have tunnel vision. You're working on that challenge and working on that mission. And I've always known about the support, you know, the importance of um, how we show up and how do we support. But when we were on that path to go public, where we're like, this is the moment we're gonna talk about like this crisis in caregiving around the world. And you know, we have all this data and all of this research. And there was a lot of questions about how did a diverse team of women actually go off and raise the money. And then looking at the data, it was rather dismal. Um, not only was it dismal, there was actually some concern expressed by um, uh, one of our donors of, I won't say our donors, see I'm already in, uh, you know, thinking about endowments <laughs> yes. in higher ed, but one of our investors of, 
um, by, you know, some of our team members were racially ambiguous. There was no denying who I was of would my face actually lower our potential valuation? Like, could that be a challenge because of the state of the world? Um, so there's definitely been some highs and some lows. That must have been a very, very difficult conversation and difficult that experience was, uh, for you. Really, that was definitely one of those lows. That was definitely one of those lows, and I think it was definitely a low on the fact that a dear friend had to have that conversation with me of, you know, what do we do? Um, so there were a lot of those conversations around what do we do, and, you know, fast forward of where we are today, I'm not gonna say that, like, we're there by far, we're not, um, but more from going from, hey, we're gonna have a niche fund or a niche conversation or this small nonprofit that's gonna focus on this, we're seeing that there's a focus and um, a very intentional uh, process that organizations are going through, yes. and it's almost everywhere. It is. Um, so I do find that encouraging. Um, just had a, a cohort, we ha started something called this Black Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership uh, Program, and it was, it's, it's just been an absolute joy and inspiring, um, but there's still so much to do. There's so much work to be done, but it's such important work. And actually, you've really answered one of my questions because I was going to ask you, people have very different views, and I think it's quite controversial whether or not we should have programs for women entrepreneurs, programs, as you've said, for black women entrepreneurs, um, you know, programs for other kinds of entrepreneurs, and whether we should sort of single out special groups and whether that's a right way of approaching the problem or not. And I, I think it's often something that you know, people have very um, sharp and extreme views about. So I've had some of those conversations, and um, I think it's a yes and. I think there's something so important um, about an affinity group of coming together and acknowledging a shared experience and some measure of shared challenges and being able to share some of those best practices or tools or knowing that you're not alone and, um, and having some of these things. And then being able to, when you move into the collective or the whole, um, you have some other strategies. So your initial reaction isn't to retreat. You know, so when someone asks you a question, it's like, how can you uh, think about what is your intended longer term result? And, you know, is it an opportunity to educate? Is it a teachable moment? You know, to sort of guide those reactions. And I do think the power and affinity groups and my own thoughts have changed over time as it relates to this and sort of going back and forth. You know, one of the um, things that I was looking into while I was at MIT, I was like, do we need uh, an accelerator program that's just mm -hmm. focused on people of color? Yes. Because they're, they're not getting into those programs. Do we need funds that are just focused on people of color? And, you know, going out and talking to people and not telling them what you wanted to do. So many of those folks are like, I just want to be known as a great leader. I just want to be a great entrepreneur. Um, so I think it's a definite yes and an and. I think the and both, the yes and, is incredibly important. So I actually agree with you. I, I, I remember sitting through some discussions that can sometimes be profoundly depressing actually about um, how we think about women as entrepreneurs, some of the statistics. I mean, I'm yes. often the creator of some of those statistics. I do the studies. I do the studies that have quite depressing results sometimes. And I find that quite difficult because you have to sort of put the data and the facts on the table, but we then have to have those in order to be able to move forward with a serious set of conversations about what we do. I think sometimes being in a room together can really help us. I agree. Um, and then the, the question is then, as you say, how do we move into the collective? And also, how do we educate everybody to appreciate that there are these challenges and we need to kind of bring some shared experiences? But I, I'm very much with you in the end both, but it does take some time to really think through the logic of that. And not everybody's going to want to be in those affinity groups. And I think we have to say that that's okay. I agree. It is absolutely okay. Um, you know, depending on what's going on in the organization, and the tone at the top of the organization, being in one of those affinity groups may not be a comfortable place. Um, and so maybe you have to do that outside the organization. Yes, I've certainly been very um, proud
proud actually to take on as well as being associate dean for innovation as i think you know i now am associate dean for innovation and inclusion and for me those seem like such a natural pairing because obviously to be innovative to follow this mission and purpose you actually need to have a diverse and inclusive team where people with different skills and backgrounds and representation can kind of bring their ideas to bear and uh, so that for me has been a very nice convergence of different parts of my identity and so I think it's really something that's quite important to how we're beginning to think about how we educate and how we teach, what we want our classrooms to feel like, who we want in the room, and who stands in front of the room. I think it can't be underestimated the importance of, of being a role model. I said, I mean, you've talked about mentoring and being a role model. Um, people will always ask you, you know, what are the sort of tips that you want to give people? What are the kind of, what's the sort of advice that you give to entrepreneurs starting out? Uh, what are some of those things that you that you particularly want to share with people? Absolutely. So I will answer that question, but first, I love that innovation and inclusion is combined at MIT. I love that you're on this role and have been following on some of the things that you've been doing on campus. Um, so really exciting. So uh, pulling back on thinking about um, uh, ways of supporting entrepreneurs or some of those uh, tips. Um, one, I try to do it in such a way that's authentic. Um, I have found one of the most impactful things that I can do is to bring entrepreneurs together who are going through sort of a same similar stage and state. You know, one of the things that uh, you know, used to happen in the summertime with my, my family would travel a little longer than I could. Um, I took it as an opportunity to bring together either a diverse group of entrepreneurs that I have been supporting, a diverse group of women that I have been supporting so they could be in conversation together. Um, again, I think there's power in knowing that, hey, oh, you're having that same experience or, oh, you went to that accelerator too and, oh, did you have this experience or here's how I did it or here's who I'm trying to raise against so, or, you know, so I thought that was really powerful, but there's been a, a few things of, um, I think is most important is meeting people where they're at, as opposed to where I want them to be. Yes. And that has taken me some time, uh, particularly on some of the founders who come out of great places like MIT, or you know, we're surrounded by great schools in New England, um, and where they've gone through one accelerator, and maybe now they've gone through a second accelerator and they have some traction, and they come and say, I want to do a third one. And inside, I'm thinking, why would you do a third accelerator? You know, with sort of your progress and where you are. Um, but I have to meet them where they're at and sort of their thought process. Um, same thing on, um, I think the great thing about having access to advisors in our ecosystem um, is that you get access to brilliant people somehow sometimes who give you conflicting ideas and as the entrepreneur we encourage yes. them always we do um, to <laughs> know your own north um, that you can take all this information but ultimately you have to decide and one of those places where I've learned that I have to meet people where they're at sometimes that advice can lead them to doubt themselves where they are and to do you know a pivot off of a path um, for a while. So one of those places that I think is super important is recognizing that it's someone else's entrepreneurial journey. And where are those places that you can support them? Uh, because if I pull back early stage, everyone has the same challenge of figuring out what's the problem you're truly solving and who yes. are you solving it for? And yeah. it's really more about how do we support them as they navigate that. Mm -hmm. So Donna, throughout our conversation, you've, you've mentioned a few times, you know, people having self-doubt as an entrepreneur, not always having the confidence. Um, I think that's actually something that we know that women tend to suffer from more significantly than um, our male colleagues sometimes. All the data show that to be true. So that's not just a personal or lived experience on, on, on my part, although I think it's also true. Um, how do you cope with that? So how do you, um, and how do you talk to your daughter, for example? about that. Absolutely. So, um, you know, that's hysterical. I just gave my daughter a shirt this morning. This is actually, I can, um, to remind her. So I'm definitely, you know, that mother that like, I guess it's not even a subliminal message of sending her all of sort of, you know, these messages that you'll see in her room and all around. And um, 
one of the ways, if I start with my daughter, um, I work really hard to make sure that she's also surrounded by amazing people, particularly women who were doing great things. Um, I was invited to do uh, like a, a 24 hours or 48 hours women's starting weekend for Techstars. And I thought, oh, okay, can I bring like 10 little girls with me? You oh, know, can they come and, yes, I like, <laughs> like, and like mm -hmm. meet these? You know, and they had a fantastic time. They sort of opened their eyes to sort of this new set of possibilities. Um, that they can do and sort of surround them by this community and cohort. And then, yes, yeah, she can go to her coding camp, you know, which tends to be mostly male. Um, for other things on supporting um, women or dealing sort of with that own self-doubt, there are a few different things that I do. Uh, so one, um, I am always so focused on the next milestone. This is something I know about myself that I don't take a lot of time to celebrate or even to remember the past accomplishment. Um, so now I've started writing it down. So when I'm having one of those moments, I can go back of like, oh yeah, but you solved this before. Like, why can't you solve it again? You just have to get the right people in the room. And that seems to me to be one of those sorts of ideas about self-confidence, because this is not just something that um, women suffer from. I mean, everybody around us, we all have moments of self-doubt. And so I think thinking about that as a way of remembering and, and life is moving at this extraordinary pace. And as you say, particularly as an entrepreneur, I think entrepreneurs have this extraordinary need and skill in having to project quite far out into the future. Imagine a future in which I've solved this problem. This is what it's going to look like. You've got to paint that picture, but then you have to decide what you're going to do tomorrow and the next day and the next day, which I think makes it really difficult to look back and to say, oh, I accomplished something. <laughs> exactly, it's like, wait, no. You can, you know, you can do this too. How do you pull back? And then um, I think the last thing, and I talk a lot to uh, students about this and anyone who's presenting or pitching, uh, you know, uh, I'm big into what is your current soundtrack? Um, like what's that either quote, um, that song, that something that puts you into a space, walking into a room. So I've known times after walk into a really tough room, you know, um, I think about, for me, it was my grandfather, who was like one of the few people who believed I could do anything. And, uh, and so I listen to his music before I walk into that room to remind me of like, hey, how do you pull this out of your life and fully occupy the space where you stand right now mm, as you walk into this room? And so same thing for anyone who has to pitch or any sort of tough situation of like, okay, what's that thing for you? I don't care what it is or how ridiculous, um, do it. And, um, you know, going back to sort of one of those demo days, the students were dancing on the side because <laughs> they were just pumping themselves up. They're like, this is what happens for me. Just give me my thing. Like, go ahead. Am I allowed to ask you <laughs> what that soundtrack is from your grandfather? Oh, absolutely. There's um, uh, Dave Brubeck. Um, so um, we'll listen to two or three songs. That's one. Um, if I have to do media, uh, that song, Let Me Clear My Throat, uh, still cracks me up to this day. You know, I was doing that with one of our, our PR people. It's like, let's just take a moment. Okay, all right, I'm in the zone. Let's go do this now. I like that. Um, but it's, what is it that does it for you? And you know, it can change over time. Well, I will have to tell people that um, as, as part of teaching, one of the things that being on Zoom and having all this technology and what have you, occupying the actual physical classroom, but having Zoom and all the students, we have wonderful tech support who's been helping all of MIT Sloan through this very, very difficult time and, and making sure that we can teach effectively. Uh, my tech guy, Monty, has always been brilliant at putting on a soundtrack. <laughs> and so my particular one that I ask him to do is a tremendous amount of Freddie Mercury and Bohemian <coughs> Rhapsody. I, oh my gosh, I love that. So I that is what that. gets the entire class into the zone <laughs> for learning. And sometimes it's we're the champions, but not always. <laughs> <laughs> I might add that one. I love that. So. I have a few questions that um, I think have come in from people who really just, you know, want to, I want to make sure that it's not just all the things I've been wanting to ask you, Donna, for a very, very long time. Um, and so I think that uh, we've already actually touched on a few of them about people sort of facing imposter syndrome or fear of failure. I think you've helped us understand just how to feel confident, how to occupy uh, your space. Um, Can but I add to that one? Please oh, do. Just getting comfortable with yes. failing. Um, I think most of us fail all the time. 
um, uh, this was advice from another MIT alum who said, fell up. Um, you know, stop thinking about, I don't have the experience or that next opportunity. Her message was that we only remember the last failure. So just fell up, like just go bigger um, and get comfortable with that. You know, we worked hard on getting comfortable with the discomfort. It's okay to fail. It, you know, you're not pushing yourself hard enough if you're not failing and learning from that experience. So let me pick up on this learning question because, again, it seems to me that one of the things that we do all the time in startups or any kind of new project is we have this theory of the future. And so we're basically running experiments all the time. And an experiment means we're learning, we're generating information. But that information is always a bit messy and ambiguous, especially when we're not actually in the lab, although even when yes. we are with our white coats <laughs> on there, we're, it's still quite messy and ambiguous. And so we somehow have to be able to use this judgment of knowing when to still believe in that theory of the future, even though the data is very, very messy, and when, in fact, to know that we do need to stop and we need to change direction. And that's obviously a matter of judgment. It's also a matter of knowing how much to sort of be committed to a very specific view of the future versus being willing to adapt because of what you're learning as you go along. Yeah. Now, how do you do that? So part of that is going back to back in the lab, the importance of the test plan of you know, what are those things that you're testing and what are the series of tests that you're gonna do that can help you solve that next problem or, or you know, uh, either disprove or reinforce that next milestone that you need to accomplish. And sometimes you know, the reality is that the learning you come back, it's just too early. And sometimes uh, you say it's too early, so you repeat the test in a few different ways and the data comes back again. Um, I feel like, you know, if it's two or three times, there's a message and you need to listen to that message um, and move forward uh, all the time. It's just opinion until you have data. And if there's a pattern, even if you don't like it, yes. uh, it's time to move on. It's time to stop. Yeah. It really is in that whole idea of the sort of learning loops that we've always talked about. Yes. I think that is very much at the core of how we think about those innovation loops, experiment, evaluate, that continual cycle of experimentation. But as you say, yes. it's about listening and evaluating with a clear eye. And it's also about designing the experiments. And that's one of the things I especially yes. like because, of course, that definitely plays to MIT's strengths as yes. uh, a very deeply technical institution, but putting right. this into the more economic. And I think that's where you do your debate. That's like the power of the team of, is this the right set of experiments um, going back to it? So that's when it's great to have a community. Yeah, that's really interesting, Donna, thank you. And so I wanted to ask you, well, so we have a question which I think I get asked quite frequently. And I'm so I imagine you do too now in your current chosen uh, career path, which is can innovation and entrepreneurship really be taught? I'm putting the emphasis on the really <laughs> on behalf of whoever the question asker was, but that used to be the favorite dinner party question that I was asked when I used to go out. And I'm about to say, and I knew you came from MIT. No, on uh, pulling back, so it's definitely a yes. Um, and there are so many different frameworks. I can't say that everyone, you know, um, how can I put this? People do it in all sorts of ways, but it can definitely be taught. Um, you know, the, the image that I think that's painted um, by people only telling the success stories, it's more of like this person was walking down the street, they had this aha moment, they went and did something, and they changed the world. You know, that's never really the story, um, but that's like a really great soundbite. Um, or uh, this notion that the team came together, they sat around a ping pong table, and the rest is history. Like, we, we know it as we have plenty of teams still sitting around ping pong tables trying to figure it out. Um, one of the things that um, I loved about MIT was this notion of frameworks. And there's so many different frameworks that you can bring to bear just to understand where you are. Um, rather it's, um, you know, I'm trying to do my business model canvas or I'm trying to figure out um, how am I gonna launch this on sort of this entrepreneurial framework. If I'm thinking about, I wanna impact an entire ecosystem, you know, and thinking about sort of the REIT program and the same framework that's used for Idea Lab, all of that can be taught. Um, it's, you know, I think it's us uh, pulling back and figuring out how do we uh, sort of pull the curtain back with a different narrative and 
having entrepreneurs come forward to say, you yeah, know, it wasn't really easy, um, but there was definitely a process that we followed, um, that there was learning and uh, pivots along the way that advisors came to bear. And, uh, you know, sometimes your education and the support you receive really does matter. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think this idea that there are frameworks, that there are some fundamental ideas, that there is this idea of learning and learning loops and pathways and journeys, uh, that we can bring different frameworks to bear at different moments, and that then we can ask entrepreneurs to tell their story in the light of those frameworks yes. helps us move away from these rather heroic narratives that have been tremendously simplified, or that you look in the rearview mirror and it all <laughs> is obvious and completely perfect and nobody exactly. argued. Um, to something that just feels a little more gritty and, and really expresses the uncertainty and the complexity of the situation. So I've spent some time in this last year as I've been teaching thinking about whether we can use examples of failure, not simply to depress everybody um, in an already rather difficult time, but actually as ways of trying to understand and learn when things go wrong. Because obviously success has many parents. Yes. Uh, failure can actually be sort of diagnosed in some slightly more interesting ways. And so I'm curious, do you ever use any failure examples? I, I'm there with you, and I think it's a balance. I worry sometimes that I use too many failure examples on um, the learning, on trying to make sure um, that we're telling the whole story. You know, I want people to be inspired. You know, you want to go out and you want to, you know, name your X, your Y, or your Z. I want to inspire you to move forward but I also want you to move forward with eyes wide open. Yes. And I think uh, by sharing those stories of failure and how do you sort of unpack them, um, you help people avoid making those exact same states or to understand where in that moment, what to do next. So I think it's tremendously impactful and important. But as you say, we need to have a balance between, <laughs> there has to be a between balance. those things. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, we're going to drive everybody out of our classrooms. <laughs> so, Donna, look, I just I want to thank you so much mm. for coming, for talking to me. I've absolutely um, enjoyed this conversation, every moment of it. I've learned a lot. And I'm really delighted to have you as a colleague um, at MIT and uh, in your new leadership role at Babson College. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to having a chance to come and listen and learn from you in your classroom uh, and welcome you back into mine whenever we both have the time to do that. Mm -hmm. I know all the alumni will be very, very appreciative of you coming and sharing and reminiscing a little bit about your time at MIT Sloan. I'm sure it's brought back many memories for everybody. So Donna, with that, thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, first of all, it is such an honor um, to be here, and I am so excited to reconnect with my classmates and my faculty and staff members uh, from this cohort. So thank you very much. Thank you.